The recent Starship launch was such a monumental event that even people who usually couldn't care less about space rockets are buzzing with excitement, sharing their amazement at how it's shaken up the entire space industry. Although the liftoff was smoother and more successful than the previous four launches, the part that really grabbed people's attention was the Mechazilla mid-air catch of the Super Heavy booster. It was an unexpected and impressive moment, showing just how advanced SpaceX's technology has become. But while much of the focus has been on the stunning booster catch and the soft landing of the Starship, another element of the mission deserves attention, and that's Stage Zero. Stage Zero, which consists of the launch pad and the towering Mechazilla, played a crucial role in the success of this mission. It withstood the immense power of 33 Raptor engines and supported the mid-air catch of the booster. Before the launch, there were serious concerns about whether the area beneath the launch pad could withstand the incredible force from the Raptor engines. After all, these engines produce an astonishing 16 million pounds of thrust, creating enormous stress on the ground below. In past flights, this immense force caused significant damage to the launch pad, with craters forming beneath the rocket and requiring extensive repairs. Stage Zero was a key factor in the success of Starship Flight 5. Its role wasn't just to support the rocket during liftoff, but also to handle the mid-air catch of the Super Heavy booster. This infrastructure was built to manage the enormous stresses of launching and catching the world's largest rocket, and it performed well during this latest test flight. In the first flight, the goal was to get the rocket off the ground, so damage to the launch mount wasn't seen as a major issue. As Musk said during that launch, if the mount survived, it was a success. There were no plans to catch the booster or attempt reusability in that flight. So the crater and damage, while significant, weren't deal-breakers. However, the situation was different for Flight 5. This time, the mission included the critical task of catching the booster mid-air using the Mechazilla arms. The success of this catch depended on the booster being able to return to the launch site, hover, and be caught with precision. Any damage to the launch mount or the pad could have affected the booster's ability to return safely and attempt the catch. SpaceX's recent upgrades, including a water deluge system, helped reduce the amount of erosion and damage to the pad. The deluge system floods the area under the rocket with water during launch, cooling the exhaust and preventing it from blasting away the concrete. These improvements helped prevent the kind of major damage seen in the first launch. Even though some damage occurred, the booster was still able to return to the pad and attempt the mid-air catch. But still, the Starship Flight 5 didn't go off without a hitch. One of the most noticeable issues occurred during the booster's hover maneuver. As the Super Heavy booster was descending back toward the launch site, a fire broke out in the engine bay engulfing the lower part of the rocket in flames. The fire occurred during a critical part of the mission, right as the booster was performing its final landing procedures. The cause of the fire is still being investigated, but it appears to have been related to the intense heat generated by the Raptor engines as they worked to bring the booster in for a precise mid-air catch. Despite the flames, the booster managed to land without any major issues, though some scorching was visible on its exterior. This fire was likely a result of thermal stress on certain components of the rocket, and it's something that SpaceX engineers will undoubtedly be looking into for future flights. This wasn't the only problem that arose during the launch. During the liftoff phase, the extreme forces generated by the Raptor engines caused scorching on various parts of the launch infrastructure, including the quick disconnect systems. These systems are critical because they connect the rocket to the launch pad and handle the fuel flow during launch. While the booster quick disconnect did its job effectively, detaching from the rocket at the right moment it was left charred and rusted from the heat. However, the most important thing is that the quick disconnect systems remained operational, and there were no significant malfunctions that could have jeopardized the mission. Just hours after the flight, the Super Heavy booster was lowered back onto the orbital launch mount using the chopstick arms with no stability issues. The booster's ability to be reused so quickly is a key part of SpaceX's plan for rapid reusability, and this quick turnaround is a promising sign that they are getting closer to achieving their goal of multiple launches per day. 
Another area that showed signs of wear was the ship quick disconnect system, which detaches Starship from the fueling lines. Like the booster quick disconnect, the ship quick disconnect sustained some scorching from the heat of the Raptor engines. However, despite the high temperatures, the ship quick disconnect remained remarkably clean post-flight, almost as if nothing had happened. The chopstick arms, designed to catch the super-heavy booster midair, also performed admirably. At first glance, they appeared unaffected by the weight of the booster, but slow-motion footage revealed that the immense mass of the Super Heavy caused the chopsticks to bend slightly, by about 15 centimeters. This may sound like a lot, but it's within the acceptable limits for the system, and it didn't impact the overall performance of the catch. The goal is to eventually reuse boosters quickly, and for that to happen, the launch pad needs to withstand multiple launches without requiring major repairs after each one. The build-up to this flight wasn't without its challenges, though. Leading up to the launch, SpaceX faced significant hurdles, particularly with the FAA, which had initially been hesitant to approve the launch license. In fact, the FAA wasn't planning to give the green light for the launch until November. This caused frustration within the SpaceX team, as the vehicle had been ready for months, with engineers eager to proceed with the crucial test. Musk himself expressed disappointment with the delays, emphasizing how regulatory barriers were slowing down innovation. However, things took a surprising turn in the final days of preparation. Behind the scenes, SpaceX worked intensively to meet all regulatory requirements, pushing hard to get the necessary approvals. After several rounds of discussions, the FAA finally issued the launch license just in time for the October window. The approval marked a critical moment in the timeline, as any further delays would have pushed the test flight into late 2024. With the license secured, the SpaceX team moved quickly to prepare for launch. Engineers performed extensive checks on the vehicle, going through final rehearsals and reviewing flight sequences to ensure everything was in place. The ground team worked around the clock, finalizing last-minute adjustments to both the Super Heavy booster and the Starship upper stage, known as S-30. When the day of the launch arrived, the atmosphere at SpaceX's Starbase was electric. After a smooth countdown, Starship finally launched from its Texas pad, ascending into the sky in what seemed like a flawless performance. The first part of the flight, involving Super Heavy booster B-12, went off without a hitch. At T plus 2 minutes and 40 seconds, the two stages of the rocket separated successfully. The six engines of S-30 ignited and pushed it away from the booster. Everything seemed to be working fine at this stage. By T plus 7 minutes and 59 seconds, the three vacuum engines shut down, followed by the sea level engines at T plus 8 minutes and 27 seconds. At this point, S-30 was climbing without any problems. S-30 reached a maximum altitude of 212 kilometers and stayed at that height for over three minutes. At T plus 22 minutes and 24 seconds, the ship began its descent after reaching a top speed of 26,756 kilometers per hour at T plus 46 minutes and 54 seconds. The descent started normally, and the re-entry process kicked off at T plus 45 minutes and 33 seconds, with a pink plasma glow signaling that S-30 was entering the atmosphere and heating up. At first, everything seemed to be going well. The ship's parts stayed intact during the early stages of re-entry, and the flaps worked as they should. The cameras provided a clear view of the process, which was an improvement over previous flights where visibility was limited during re-entry due to heat and plasma. However, as the ship got closer to landing, problems started to show up. At T plus 58 minutes and 38 seconds, the camera footage revealed sparks near the joint between one of the flaps and the main body of the ship. At first, it didn't look too serious, but things quickly got worse. By T plus one hour, five minutes, and 53 seconds, flames became visible coming from that same area. The fire grew, indicating that something had gone wrong with the vehicle's structure. One possible reason for the failure could be an issue with the heat shield or the flap mechanism itself. The extreme heat and pressure during re-entry put a lot of stress on the flaps and their joints. If there was any weakness in the flap mechanism or a flaw in the heat shield, it could lead to damage like this. 
The joint between the flap and the ship is a critical point because it takes on both aerodynamic stress and high heat. A problem at this point could cause a failure in the re-entry process, leading to the sparks and eventually the fire. As the fire continued to spread, the situation became more critical. Just before the ship reached the water, there was a huge explosion. The exact cause of the explosion isn't known yet, but it could have been caused by internal fuel or other components reaching a critical temperature and igniting. The explosion destroyed most of the ship, leaving little chance of recovering any intact parts. This is a serious issue for SpaceX. While the Super Heavy Booster B-12 was caught successfully, and that's a big achievement, the real challenge is with the Starship upper stage. The upper stage is the part of the rocket that needs to go into space, carry cargo, and then return safely. If the upper stage can't be recovered and reused, the entire goal of making a fully reusable spacecraft becomes much harder to achieve. The upper stage, like Ship 30, is the key part because it has to survive space travel, perform missions, and then return through Earth's atmosphere. The booster's job is to launch it, but the upper stage is what does the important work in orbit. So, SpaceX needs to focus on figuring out why Ship 30 failed and fixing those problems before they can achieve their goal of reusability. While the booster's success is a good sign of progress, the failure of Ship 30 shows there's still a long way to go. Despite these issues, SpaceX announced that the mission was a success, saying, Splashdown confirmed. The ship landed precisely on target in the ocean, which was one of the main goals of this flight. Although the ship didn't stay intact, SpaceX achieved at least one of the two major objectives they had set for this flight. This means the flight still demonstrated some progress for SpaceX, especially compared to the issues seen in previous flights. The fact that S-30 lasted longer and had fewer problems early on in the flight shows improvement in the vehicle's design. Compared to earlier flights, particularly the third and fourth Starship tests, Flight 5 showed clear signs of progress. In Flight 3, Starship didn't even manage to separate from the booster properly, resulting in a failure to complete the mission's primary goals. The vehicle experienced engine problems early in the ascent, and both stages were lost before reaching critical milestones. In Flight 4, while there were some improvements, the vehicle still struggled during re-entry. Starship S-29 from that flight faced a massive failure due to issues with the heat shield, leading to significant damage long before the ship could attempt a controlled landing. In contrast, Flight 5 showed that SpaceX has learned from these previous failures and made real improvements in key areas. One of the most important changes was the upgraded heat shield. After the heat shield failures on Flight 4's S-29, SpaceX worked on reinforcing the thermal protection system, making it twice as strong as the previous version, according to Musk. The fact that S-30 survived re-entry for a longer period without major damage is a clear indication that these improvements are working, even though the ship ultimately suffered structural issues toward the end of the flight. For those who didn't see the Starship launch in person, I've got a surprise. You can still experience it with a realistic Starship model made just for our loyal viewers. Since you've watched this far, we know you're one of them. Head to the link in the description to grab yours now and relive space history. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you in the next video.